All right, hello everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Middle Aged Metalhead. And today we're doing something a little different. We've got one of my oldest friends on board, who's uh, a real jazz head, if you will, instead of being a metalhead. Well, he's that too. But yeah, so I figured for metalheads to broaden their horizons a little bit, and also because jazz is one of those genres that I could personally never get into. So he's going to be talking about. 10 albums to get into if you're interested in getting into jazz. So sort of like a jazz primer for beginners. So uh, he's a musician, he's a poet, he's an author, he's an animal rights activist, a lover of all animals. Uh, please welcome on board Jay Prakash Satyamurti, Japes. Hi. <laughs> that's, that's quite an introduction. <laughs> So I'm going to be talking about 10 plus two records, 12, in fact, from my collection, because uh, I kind of uh, got carried away. And I also realized I wanted to include at least one vocal jazz selection as well for those who are interested in that. Um, so these won't necessarily be the top jazz albums of all time, although a lot of them are. And uh, they're all hopefully a little different uh, so you'll find something that might interest you in it. Awesome. Okay. So should we get started? Yeah. I've also stuck only to things I actually have in my collection. So I can yeah, show off sense. for LP covers. Cool. So yeah. first of all, we have Miles Davis. Now it's very difficult deciding what to recommend by Miles Davis. And in fact, uh, after I offer the one that I've selected, I will mention a couple of others. This is... Kind of Blue by Miles Davis. Yeah. It's probably the best selling jazz album of all time, even now. Uh, it's got an amazing lineup. It's got Miles Davis himself on trumpet. It's got John Coltrane on saxophone. It's got, uh, it's got, it's got uh, Bill Evans, the amazing pianist. It's got Julian Adderley on one track. It's got uh, an amazing rhythm section of Paul Chambers on bass and uh, James Cobb on drums. So this was made uh, when Miles Davis started getting into the concept of modal music, which is something that is actually quite familiar to all of us in India, because uh, Indian classical, which is every tune is based on a raga, is essentially modal music. A mode is a particular way in which you traverse a scale. And that's what each raga is, basically. It's a particular formula. And of course, ragas are a little more complicated than Western modes because in many ragas, you have a particular sequence you use when ascending the scale and a different one you use in descending it. But uh, essentially, most Hindustani tunes and so on that you listen to are named for the raga they're in because that is the only real basis. Unlike, say, in most jazz, which is based around, say, a tune, you know, a riff, uh, what jazz people like to call a head. And then you improvise around that. And then sometimes if you're playing a jazz tune that's kind of adapted from an old Broadway show tune or a pop song, you'll have your head, you'll have your verse, you'll have your bridge and so on. So, you know, conventional uh, Western pop song uh, architecture, which jazz pretty much followed. But uh, Miles Davis started getting fascinated by this idea that instead of writing chord changes for my band, I'll just write a scale down for them and establish a mood and a tempo. Uh, so from that idea, emerged this amazing album. It's a very smooth, very mellow album, but at no point is it elevator music. You can yeah. listen to it, and relax with it in the background, but anytime you focus on it, there's lovely stuff going on. Yeah. And uh, even though it's not one of his heavy, fast electric albums, I think just because it's such good music, any metalhead would get the point of it. However, if you're looking to get into the more extreme end of Miles Davis, obviously Bitches Brew, which I have an amazing collector's edition of it, which I forgot to bring to this room <laughs> to show off about. <laughs> Bitches Brew is a great way to understand electric Miles. Uh, and okay. there again, it becomes a groove over which everyone goes into wild uh, extempore. And the sense of structure is, you know, very subtle. And, you know, one thing that a lot of rock and metal musicians take from uh, certain jazz musicians like Miles is the virtuosity of their lead playing, their soloing. Uh, so that's uh, another thing which when you listen to the heavier, faster, or even the slower albums, because even metal uh, bands often slow it down and have really soulful wailing solos, right? Uh, 
So yeah. that's that could be one way in for you to understand like the solo is the thing, you know, and how good is the solo? How interesting is it? How emotional is it? How many places does it take you? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So, this is actually just, one of those uh, albums that I've heard and that I've grown to sort of like. You might like uh, you might like Bitches Brew even more possibly, because I know you like uh, a lot of that sort of uh, almost concrete music, Afrobeat kind oh. of stuff. And Bitches Brew is where he's sort of walking into that territory also. Okay, you know, long songs with a mile wide groove and lots of textures, and everyone sort of comes in and out and blows on top of it. Uh, mm. So. If you like kind of blue, you could go back and explore Miles Davis's albums with the jazz composer and arranger Gil Evans, in particular Sketches of Spain, which is a wide open, slow, mellow, but powerful album. If you want to go in a more ferocious direction, Bitches Brew and a lot of the albums subsequent to that, particularly the live albums, uh, like uh, Live Evil and Black Beauty are just wild jams. I think the first time I probably heard Miles Davis was in Picos back in the day. There was just some wild shit going on and someone was playing a trumpet through a wah and I asked Paul, what is this? And he said, yeah, this is Miles Davis live evil. Okay. And I was like, hey man, what is this wild stuff? <laughs> <laughs> so that's, cool. that, that's Miles Davis. Yeah. Uh, should I move on? Yeah. yeah. Cool. So if you're talking about Miles Davis, you really have to start talking about John Coltrane, who is on the previous oh. album I spoke about. This is known to be John Coltrane's absolute masterpiece, A Love Supreme. A Love Supreme is one of those albums that has influenced people across genres. I'm sure there's hip hop artists who talk about it. Uh, I know that uh, Carlos Santana and John McLaughlin were tremendously influenced by it, so much so that they made an album together uh, in which they covered some of the stuff from this. Oh, okay. uh, uh, forgetting the name of the album. That's when they were both disciples of Sri Chinmoy. Huh, yeah, where Santana was calling himself Devadip. Yes, yes, oh, Devadip. That's the one. Yeah. Uh-huh. He also made an amazing album with Alice Coltrane when he was uh-huh. in that frame of mind. In that zone, yeah. In that zone. <laughs> uh, so, A Love Supreme is again, you know, later in his career, Coltrane would make some really wild, noisy albums. To the extent that jazz people were turning their back on him, you know. Okay. Uh, there was Ascension, which has got basically like 9, 10, 11, 12 of the hottest new free jazz musicians instead of the people of his, you know, vintage right. hard bop, bebop era. Because he was just fascinated by playing with new people, which is also true of Miles, which is why throughout Miles' career, he's always bringing in side men who have something new you know, to give him and the yeah. band. And at one time, of course, Coltrane was one of those people in his band. Uh, let me just silent my phone. I think it's causing a few blips here and there. Yeah, so uh, with A Love Supreme, John Coltrane is in that midway path. He was always thought to be a little ferocious for conventional jazz, but not for our years. Yeah. I think, I think even the album where they say he's pretty wild in the mid 60s are for us quite melodic and because he expanded the musical vocabulary we can understand him right that makes sense so this is an album where he's poised you know on the verge of going off into yet another range of territory but he's sort of consolidated everything before it's obviously with John Coltrane it's a very spiritual album you know the the chant a love supreme uh, comes in at some point and he's got a poem here which is sort of uh, addressed to his idea of divinity uh, but also this is his classic quartet you know uh, Elvin, uh, Elvin and, and James on uh, rhythm section, McCoy Tyner on uh, piano who was his amazing companion almost until he became too wild and then sort of uh, McCoy Tyner okay. leaves and he has his own wife, Alice Coltrane, in the band in his last few oh. albums. Uh, and he's got a couple of extra musicians, Archie Shep and Tenor Sax, Art Davis, uh, and so on. So it's an amazing suite. It's actually five songs that all, you know, kind of build together. So you listen to the whole oh, thing. Okay. And the rhythms in it are so powerful and beautiful. I think these are the kind of hypnotic rhythms that people have sort of built from in 
uh, Afro Groove. Uh, I'm sure Fela Kuti has listened to this album in yeah. his time. Yeah. And a lot of today's musicians who play on the more Afro Groove side mm. of jazz, you know, people whom I really admire, like Kamasi Washington, or from Britain, you have Nubaya Garcia, and people yeah. like that. I think, I think they're still, you know, learning from Coltrane. Right. Uh, if you want to get into, if you're a metal fan who's also a bit of a noise fan, you know, like Merzbau and uh, all that sort of stuff, you could yeah. check out uh, Ascension, a later album of his. Okay. Uh, it's, it's really some fierce blowing by everyone involved. You could check out, and I can only hear this album once in my lifetime, a bit like Metal Machine Music, Ohm, huh. which okay. is like 22 to 25 minutes of just wild, unstructured, I don't know what. Okay. And then, if that's blown your mind enough, circle back to a more mellow album of his, like Ole, which has a wonderful Spanish feel. Uh, okay. Or uh, My Favorite Things, in which famously he takes the my Fair Lady tune, huh. uh, my favorite things, and makes it into this huge, beautiful 15, 20 minute jazz opus with fantastic solos. Okay. So you can treat a Love Supreme as your pivot and either go into wild, crazy shit that he did later. Uh, by the way, apart from Ohm and Ascension, there's Interstellar Space, another of his later albums, which was only released posthumously, which is just him and a drummer. And it's amazing. It's it's the more quiet, tender, delicate side of the same wild approach that you hear on home. Okay. So did uh, so Miles that's, Davis that's and, a... So did Miles Davis and Coltrane have like a similar path? Like they started traditional and then went off into very experimental areas. Yeah, to a huge extent, because both of them grew up as musicians in a time when jazz was evolving so much. Right. Like they grew up listening to people like, uh, you know, Charlie Parker and Lester Young and uh, all those who were like, uh, you know, the sort of where swing starts becoming bebop. Yeah. And uh, also they kind of came in on the end of the big band era, uh, right. like Count Basie, Duke Ellington. Yeah. And then they saw people like Charlie Parker who had done so much to progress the way, uh, you know, you could play in jazz. Mm -hmm. And I think... First of all, of course, Coltrane played with Miles. They didn't go into the same kinds of developments, but both of them evolved at the same time for the same kinds of reasons. Like right. uh, while Miles went electric, Coltrane never went electric. Yeah. Oh, for example. Okay. Huh. Yeah. Uh, Coltrane stayed with a oh, slightly more traditional jazz ensemble, but then pushed the limits right. of what he could do with it. Oh. Uh, and Coltrane had two stints with the Miles Davis band uh, oh. in which he learned a lot. And uh, in between he had a stint with Thelonious Monk, which is when uh, he kind of graduated from uh, with Frantic Young Turk into a more seasoned musician that people started oh. paying attention to. Oh. So one of the other musicians on Kind of Blue is, uh, is the alto sax player, uh, Cannonball Adderley. Oh, yeah. Okay. And he's got a lot of fantastic albums. Uh -huh. I will put forward something else. A, because it has Miles Davis on trumpet too. So you're guaranteed, if nothing else, of wonderful solos by both these men. Right. Uh, it was kind of more or less done around the same time as uh, Kind of Blue. And has a lot of the same spirit. So if you really liked Kind of Blue... This is a great way to get introduced to Cannonball Adderley. So Cannonball Adderley on alto sax was in Miles Davis's band for a long time during the same time as Coltrane was on soprano sax. And you could see that Coltrane was the one whose solos were perhaps a little less perfectly formed, but a little more searching. And Adderley was the guy who was in control of his craft, you know, always delivered right. the goods in each solo. And that's kind of what he is on his own albums also. You'll always get a really good, well played, well composed, quite exciting jazz album, bebop album, though you may not get the extremes and the new territories that someone like Coltrane kept exploring. Oh, Ooh. but yeah, I really like this album and it's oh. a well balanced album, you know, like uh, it's got its upbeat tunes, it's got its ballads, it's really nice. It's also got an amazing rendition of Autumn Leaves, which is uh, a jazz standard, I suppose, we've all heard in one form or the other with our with oh. vocals. Maybe if they ever played it in Java City. 
Probably, yeah, they must have. (laughs) (laughs) Then, sticking with people who've played with uh, Miles Davis, uh, we've got the piano player, Bill Evans, who's also the piano player on Kind of Blue. This was one of his best solo albums, Waltz for Debbie, by the Bill Evans Trio. This is one of my few really old jazz LPs, as you can see from the condition. Plays wonderfully. So... Bill Evans is an interesting pianist, quite a delicate touch. Unlike there are a lot of jazz pianists I could have told you about, like Red Garland, who are amazingly percussive. Bill Evans is right. a more delicate yeah. jazz pianist. He would often depend on the bass to establish the tonality, and he would play inversions or he would leave out the root note in his left hand chords while focusing on the melodies with his right hand. Oh. So when you're playing in a trio, in a three-piece band, as we mm-hmm. power trio, as we call it yeah. in rock, uh, with Bill Evans as the main instrument, you need a tremendous bassist. And he had one of the most uh, tremendous bassists in jazz at the time, Scott LaFaro, uh, oh, who okay. unfortunately passed away in a road accident soon after these recordings with Bill Evans. So what's interesting about these albums also is that LaFaro was almost rewriting the book for bass. He wasn't just accompanying, he took his own solos and he played a much more dynamic role. He was much heavier, though not heavy as we, I mean, define yeah. it, but definitely a more in your face approach to bass playing. Because yeah. you needed to, you needed to balance out Bill Evans. Yeah. Uh, which is not to say that Evans couldn't be a strong rhythmic player as well. But in the trio situation, I think he allowed the bass to sort of create that and then he would do his more uh, thoughtful stuff over it. Right. Uh, so that's a great place to begin with Bill Evans, Waltz for Debbie. Oh. Now, someone else who plays the piano and who Coltrane has played with. This isn't necessarily my top pick, but I know it's, it's a great album. He didn't make anything less than a great album, but it's my favorite album cover by him. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> cool. This is Thelonious <laughs> Monk Underground. Yeah. <laughs> just a fantastic legendary cover where he's posing wow. as a underground resistance leader with a yeah. captured Nazi officer and a French resistance fighter and uh, for some reason for some reason there's a cow yeah <laughs> the cow's the so total is... what the fuck <laughs> cow. Yeah. moment on that cover yeah Seriously is. Uh, according to the liner notes, which are completely fictitious, Thelonious's only pet is the cow who answers to the name Jelly Roll. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He didn't actually live like this. Anyway, so this is Thelonious Monk on piano with one of his best uh, collaborators, Charlie Rouse and tenor sax. So apart from his own amazing piano playing, you have a great sax player. You know, in general, on a jazz album, if your sax player is good, you're okay. Yeah. <laughs> So be prepared to start liking saxophone a lot if you're going to explore jazz. That's jazz, right? Yeah. yeah. And it's a great instrument, you know. I think the sax mm. for jazz from the 50s onwards is what the electric guitar is for rock. And right. Blue metal. It is the most versatile, most beloved uh, yeah. speaking instrument. So this is a typical Thelonious Monk set. I mean, it's got up-tempo numbers, it's got down-tempo numbers, and it's just got Thelonious Monk, whose rhythms are strange and interesting, whose piano work is always a little eccentric and wonderful, and whose solos are always sparkling and effervescent. (laughs) And uh, with Monk, again, just incredible consistency throughout his career. So... Uh, you want to explore more Monk, if you like underground, go in any direction. Some that I like are Monk's Dream, uh, Brilliant okay. Corners, uh, and Crisscross. Okay. In fact, I would have picked Crisscross, but I just wanted to show off this album cover. It's so awesome. Yeah. <laughs> and Monk, again, like Miles and Coltrane, is one of those people who brought in innovations into how jazz is composed and played. So you're going to be hearing not generic jazz but someone really interesting right. uh, now I'm now most of the people I've been playing for you are from the bebop era of jazz uh, bebop sort of evolved from swing jazz when it started becoming faster and more focused on virtuosity uh, so a lot of bebop and hardbop sometimes suffers from excessive solo like they're not even paying attention to the melody but just taking breaks and blowing solos at each other right. 
But here's a fantastic. No, no, that wasn't me. Sorry. I didn't say. I think anything. I had a little internet. Sure. Here's a fantastic example of bebop when it's well composed through and through by someone who would later also become a prolific composer of movie soundtracks. Uh, was himself a fantastic musician and has an amazing band, including people like Eric Dolphy, Bill Evans, who I mentioned to you earlier, right. who surfaces on a lot of my favorite jazz albums, Roy Haynes, Freddie Hubbard, Paul Chambers. This is Oliver Nelson's The Blues and the Abstract Truth. Oh, okay. Beautiful, beautiful cover. Uh, and just an amazing lineup of people uh, led by Nelson himself on alto and tenor saxophone, Eric Dolphy on alto saxophone and flute, who's also played with uh, Coltrane, Freddie Hubbard on trumpet, Bill Evans, you know. So what's really nice about this is it's well composed. There are interesting song structures. And then within that, the soloists each are allowed to do their thing. So this is a great album to just figure what this bebop ethos is about without it being in a framework where maybe the the strength and interest of the framework of composition is not lost either. Right. Oliver Nelson, Blues and the cool. Abstract Truth. Now we're going to go into a different extreme with something called free jazz. Now free oh. jazz, as its name suggests, has very few remaining constraints. There's right. no typical chord pattern. Jazz has a lot of typical chord patterns. You know, there's mm -hmm. the, the, the two, four, one or the blues 12 bar and and typically there's a tune, you return to the tune, you solo, you return to the tune. This was one of the guys who blew that wide open and either he's the antichrist or he's the second coming of jazz, depending on <laughs> which side of the fence you're on. Ah, okay. Ornette Coleman, The Shape of Jazz to Come. Right. Uh, very ambitious title, but I think one that the album richly deserves. And the thing is that though it's wild and it's much less structured, uh, one of the things that he did here was he stopped having a piano player. Having a pianist had become a must for a jazz band because the piano was the bridge between the rhythm and the harmony, the rhythm and the melody. Right. More so than the bass because pianos mm. can also play harmonies. Yeah. But here he did away with that. He's just got sax, that's him. Don, Don Cherry on trumpet. Don Cherry, another amazing musician who turns up on a lot of great albums. Charlie Hayden on bass, Billy Higgins on drums. So very free form. It's very wild. A lot of people at the time thought, my God, this is noise, but it's not. It's actually very beautiful, very lively music. And oh. again, I think the chaos of it is something that people who maybe like the more noisy, chaotic strains of metal, including, you know, uh, maybe elements of uh, bands like Mekong Delta, who are the less pretty structured kind of prog uh, right. metal, you know, yeah. uh, might find something interesting in Ornit Coleman. Okay. Cool. Now I'll go to, so I was talking about how Miles went electric and Coltrane didn't. Right. So some folks who played with Miles Davis, like Wayne Shorter and Joe Zavinol, and some folks who didn't, uh, formed a band that sort of became the flagship for what we call fusion jazz or jazz fusion. That is to say, jazz that uses rock elements and electronic yeah. instruments. That's Weather Report. Okay. Uh, I've chosen Black Market uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one being, it has Jaco Pastorius on bass. Not all their albums do, uh, but he's amazing. And uh, even more so than on his solo albums, which I'm still to get used to, I love him playing in the context of Weather Report. Right. Uh, I always, I don't know, I, I like hearing bassists within a band. He's also yeah. within a band on his own albums, but whatever. Anyway, so this is an amazing album because it's, uh, these people are rooted in jazz, you know, like uh, Zavinul has played with Miles Davis, Wayne Shorter in his 20s was actually a great friend of Coltrane who was 10 years older than him and used to go to his house and they would sort of uh, sit together at the piano with both their saxophones and uh, Coltrane would talk to Wayne Shorter about musical ideas and all wow. that sort of thing. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so this is very much the sound that jazz became you know, from the late 60s to the 70s. Right. And some of it, you know, also later on you get, for me, very sterile electric led jazz, like Spyro Gaira shades off into smooth jazz, easy listening ah. and all that. But I think if you listen to Wayne, uh, to Weather Report, to this album and to Heavy Weather, you hear that kind of jazz at its best. Right. And it's very atmospheric. Uh, for someone who's such a fantastic solo player, 
Wayne Shorter, the saxophonist, doesn't really take long involved solos. He does a lot of arranging and decorating around the groove, which is amazing to listen to and points, I think, so much to things which you can still hear in avant-garde forms of music, be they be them rock or jazz or anything. And uh, yeah, the whole band is just amazing. And there are also Afro uh, rhythm elements, which would increasingly become important in many kinds of jazz. Now, having spoken about Afro elements and about groove and about electronic elements, I want to take you into another electric jazz ensemble, which shares a lot of DNA with Weather Report, but is on the other side of the groove spectrum. Oh, yeah. Okay. Herbie Hancock, Headhunters. This is uh, Herbie Hancock on, uh, you know, the electric keyboards and acoustic yeah. keyboards. He played with Miles Davis for a very long time. He, uh, I think, was listening to stuff like Sly and the Family Stone and thought, good heavens, <laughs> you know, uh, I need to bring this uh, back into what I do. And uh, 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 while he's the star of this album, I, I also want to call attention to his sax player, Bernie Maupin. Uh, M-A-U-P-I-N, composes some of these songs, the ones that Hancock doesn't, and is just fantastic on these albums. So this is groovy jazz, you know, this is yeah. jazz for the mid-70s disco dance floor. Mm -hmm. uh, even more so would be some of his other albums. And then later on, as the 80s happened, he would go full into electronic music with record scratching and DJs and samples on albums like Future Shock and Rocket and so on. Oh, okay. But this era of his, yeah, Headhunters, um, Manchild and a couple of other albums after it are this amazing groove machine and it's beautiful. It, it's really fantastic. Uh, yeah, super. That's something I highly recommend. Now we get into Don Cherry, who I briefly mentioned earlier. Oh, he's yeah. He's played with Coltrane. He's, he's played with Ornette Coleman. And here he is on his own uh, with a band including Charlie Hayden and Billy Higgins from Ornett Coleman's band. So there's just four long tunes on this. Brown Rice, Malcons, which is based on the Raga Malcons, oh. Chen Rezig and Deggy Deggy. So these are long songs, you know. They're based on very, very captivating mid-tempo grooves. They're very meditative, trance-like, hypnotic. I feel that given particularly some of the, again, some of the sort of Afrofuturistic, or even uh, what was that uh, thing that we both liked so much? Uh, it's a couple of classic reggae artists with a couple of modern electronic artists. Yeah, yeah. Part of the KRC. Yeah, yeah. The, the Congos, Congos with, with the, the. What was that modern band called? Yeah, no, with, with two ambient artists. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, FRKWS sessions. It was part of that yes. series, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. So if you like that kind of thing, uh, this is amazing music. It's just okay. spacious and, and huge and, and really talks to you. Um, so now I'll get into my two extra ones. I could not have a jazz list without Sandra. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> this is uh, Sandra has a lot of sides. Uh, you know, Sonny Blount, to give him his real name, has a lot of sides to his music. There's wild albums that are just all over the place. And then there's more serene, reflective albums. This is a really good example, which sort of, as the title Languidity suggests, goes towards the more languid, liquid size, but has some up-tempo grooves like Where Pathways Meet as well. And again, long tunes, eight minutes, nine minutes, 10 minutes, you know, amazing, huge band with bassoons, flutes, oboes, all kinds of extra percussion and uh, Sandra leading everything, holding it together on his array of electronic keyboards. The sax player, John Gilmore, uh, is not very well known outside of Sandra, but he was the kind of guy who musicians like even Coltrane would talk to and get great ideas from. And uh, I think Languidity is an album that you don't have to see it as a jazz album. It's just cosmic groove music. Yeah. You know, for someone who likes maybe uh, things like Parliament, uh, you might see this as the more introspective elder brother of that kind of music. Okay. But did he start off in a more orthodox fashion and then kind of a little went wild? Or? Yeah. A little bit. Everyone went through that kind of evolution ah. because uh, he 
initially had slightly more straightforward ensembles, but he was pretty much carving out his own path and uh, uh, he yeah. didn't make like, tons of more conventional albums and then become Sandra. Right. He became oh. Sandra pretty early on yeah. uh, in his career. Yeah. Okay. So he was a real original. He didn't spend a lot of time like people like Davis or Coltrane did playing other people's music and yeah. doing other people's. He became Sandra very quickly. Yeah. It's very incredible. He, that kind of confidence to just as soon as possible just do your own thing. Yeah. I have a lot of respect for that. I did say for my last LP, I did want to bring in at least one vocal jazz album. Right. Uh, I've omitted that whole side of jazz and there have been great jazz singers over the years and in the 40s and 50s, you know, before rock and roll broke out, there was really very little difference between mainstream vocal pop and vocal jazz. A lot of the people would play on both sides of the fence, you know. And Sinatra, for example, had his start in jazz big bands. Yeah. And um, mm. always had a jazz, a huge jazz and blues element to what he was doing. Yeah. Uh, so here is, here is a oh, treasure yeah. of an album. Lady mm. Sings the Blues by Billie Holiday. As usual, it has amazing musicians on it. You've got the pianist, Winton Kelly. You've got the amazing, amazing jazz guitarist, Kenny Burrell. So, you know, the backing is just immaculate. Okay. And when someone takes a solo, like Charlie Shaver's trumpet solos are just, you know, uh, yeah. then you have that cliche scene in a detective serial where he's at a bar later at night and bam, bam, <laughs> dun, 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 you know, <laughs> that's, that's the stuff. And then it's got this amazing blue voice of Billie Holiday uh, singing some of her best songs like uh, Strange Fruit, Love Me or Leave Me, Willow Weep For Me. Yeah. Uh, I would have also thrown in some nasty uh, but, you know, one can't go on and on and on. <laughs> also thrown in, sir? Nina Simone. Nina Simone, yeah. One can't go on and on and on. Yeah. And uh, I will say that my list sort of begins with the mid-50s bebop. I have mm -hmm. not gone into swing jazz. I've not gone into big band jazz. Not that those are bad forms of jazz or they don't have anything to say to us. But this is kind of my comfort zone. From the right. bebop era to the beginnings of the electric era. Uh, for my tastes, by the late 70s, jazz, mainstream jazz is a little too, trying a little too hard to be relevant when it's not anymore. Trying too hard to either go towards pop or disco or adult contemporary pop. And yeah. the 80s for me were a very sterile decade for jazz. Uh, though I think now, you know, with people like Shakaba Hutchings in the UK and Kamasi Washington in the USA, there's really interesting things going on, and, uh, particularly the London jazz scene of uh, a lot of mixed race and uh, sort of uh, African Caribbean diaspora players is just amazing. Oh, okay. I mentioned Shakaba Hutchings, who has a band called Sons of Kemet. Uh, right. Yeah. Zubaya Garcia, who's a sax player and a band leader, who's just amazing. Yeah. Yaz Ahmed, who's a trumpet player with uh, amazing albums. Oh. Okay. Kamasi Washington. Uh, Stefan Martin, uh, just, it's really interesting again right now, I would say, jazz. Uh, one thing that happened in the 80s onwards is that people like Winton Marsalis started saying, I reject uh, all this moving into free space and electronic space and electric space and blowing and wild and noisy. And I want to go back to a very structured jazz. And he garnered so much cultural clout that I think he turned jazz into a pastiche factory of itself for a long time. Oh, okay. Which is why a lot of us who grew up in the 90s don't really have a lot of 90s jazz to point to as, oh, wow, that's why I like jazz now. You know, if yeah. at all we do, it's because we're playing tapes from slightly older artists. Right. I'm being very opinionated right now. So huh. if you have a secret horde of jazz aficionado viewers, you're going to get angry comments. <laughs> no, no, that's okay. I'm, I'm very happy to say that jazz today is in a space where uh, there's just so much that's happening and people both looking to the past and the future, employing modern day synth and keyboard at, at the same time using your, you know, traditional jazz instruments, including the upright bass and of course all right. the trumpets and saxophones and everything. I do feel a little lonely and sad when I listen to jazz bands that don't have any horns in them at all. You know, I feel like, come on, man. It's like listening to guitarless heavy metal. Yeah. I'm not quite certain this should be allowed to happen. 
<laughs> yeah. yeah, so that's that's my little run through of albums that I hope everyone will find at least one album there that's got something on it which they find pleasing. Yeah, that was great, Jips. Thanks so much, and uh, like a proper one-on-one class on jazz, at least for beginners, I guess. Few had heard with, of, like few had never certain, heard of. So, with with of course certain biases, like I'm not gone deep into the pre. Uh, late 50s yeah uh, right also because i think this is a sweet spot that a lot of rock and metal people can find in roads into yeah oh i should also generally add check out alan holdsworth because i know oh. guitar virtuosity is a great window for a metal fan into jazz and holdsworth was probably one of the most heavy uh, and uh, profound guitar players in the world.